So I'm going to introduce our speaker. Um, so Norm Billsbury is a speaker, consultant, and trainer with the Sandler Organization. Um, he has a PhD from uh, the University of Illinois and in master's is in corporate training from Illinois State. Um, he is currently the uh, Vice President of Business Development for Rev Medica, which is a startup actually um, based in Connecticut, but he's still here in Champaign-Urbana. So um, Norm has worked in sales and marketing roles for two medical device startups. He had a, the first had an exit for $800 million and the second an exit for $300 million. He works with businesses in the area of business development, leadership and coaching, sales effectiveness, effectiveness and hiring. But his most interesting fact is that he was a contestant back in the day for the old show American Gladiator. Anybody remember that? Yes. He battled thunder and nitro in front of thousands at State Farm Center, but he, where he was publicly pummeled, but has lived to tell the story. Um, and Norm lives with his wife and three children. Actually, some of them go to school with my kids. So this is a very small town, never honk at anyone. But I am going to turn this over to Norm to uh, give us this excellent presentation. So thank you so much for being here today, and we're excited to hear this. So thanks, Norm. Thank you very much. Uh, is anybody used to watch his show, American Gladiators? You seen it on TV? Anybody? About half? Uh, so uh, the, the, the way this show works is they take former pro football players that are about 275 to 325 uh, pounds and they put them up against average sized people like you and me. And then what they do is they sell a bunch of tickets. So it's kind of like uh, Christians and the gladiators back in the day, right? You have zero chance of winning but the crowd loves it. So people that were foolish, like me, uh, signed up. And, and so right here on campus, University of Illinois, back in the day, and I'm not gonna tell you how long ago it was, but they had a big trial. And 4,000 students tried out. And you had to do, uh, you had to do 60 fingertip push-ups in 60 seconds. You had to do uh, 20 pull-ups in 30 seconds, and then a couple other crazy things. And if you made it through that, you got selected. So anyway, I, I never heard this show, like many of you. So some of my fraternity brothers said, you want to do that. You're crazy, go do that. <laughs> so I said, okay. So I, I tried out and I made it. And a uh, little did I know, uh, this was gonna be a moment of fame and a moment of shame. So uh, here's how this story works out. Uh, before we uh, got situated and found our, when we were pulled up, uh, they gave us a uniform. Now this was a road show, and they gave me a red uniform. Now on the road show, it's kind of a wrestling outfit. Has anybody ever seen what wrestlers wear? Yeah, do you know that tight singlet? Okay, so I've never put anything like that on before. So that was kind of crazy. Didn't want to do that, but that's what it called for. And my color was red. Do you know what the problem is when you take red and you wash it with industrial grade soap and on a road show many times? What happens to red? It fades to pink. Right, so now I'm in a tight pink singlet. Uh, in front of all of my friends on the cross country team at U of I, my fraternity brothers, and people from Champaign who knew me. Uh, and this is pre YouTube, so you can't find it. I, I'm just telling you. I, I, my friends have searched before, it's not out there. But, anyways, it, this, the show goes like this Did any of you ever do this thing called the pugil stick in Boy Scouts? Does anybody remember that event if you've been in the military? So what, what that is, is it takes a pole with a long, oversized glove on the end of it. And they put you up on a pedestal. And what you do is you box each other like this. Now, I'm, 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 I'm like, I'm in great shape. I just finished running for Illinois uh, cross country. And I'm looking at this guy going, I'm just going to bob and weave. I'm going to smoke this guy. So this guy named Thunder, who is, I kid you not, at least 300 pounds and definitely on the juice. He's, he takes his pugil stick, and I'm like this, ready to go like this, and he takes it, turns it into a hammer, and goes like this. Boom! And I just went, boom! And I was, it was over. It was over before it started. So it was like my intro, so there's my definite moment of shame. So it was, it, it was over before it even started, but then kind of my redemption moment was this thing called Powerball. Does anybody remember this event? So they, it's just 
it's basic. They put a basket in the middle of a box room about this size, and all you can do is dunk the ball in the basket. That's all you have to do. Doesn't that seem easy? Right. So you know what I do? I'm like, uh, uh, finishing cross country season, they put 45 seconds on the clock. Now, if you're a D1 cross country athlete, you know that 45 seconds isn't even enough to warm up. So I'm thinking, okay, now redemption time. I'm going to smoke you again. So I take the ball and I do a little head fake. I end up in the center about to dunk the ball. And then all of a sudden, it goes dark. How many of you have ever really blacked out? Honestly, anybody here ever blacked out? Yeah, what's it feel like? Sucks a lot. <laughs> yeah. Did, did you know what was happening to you when it happened? Yeah, well, it happened when I was playing soccer in high school and I got kicked in the head, so I kind of saw the foot coming. Okay, so you saw it. Okay. Anybody else? Do you, do you kind of know that time ceases to exist in a blackout? So here's what happened. I literally trying to get my breath back, and I like wake up, and I think an hour has passed. I look at the clock. Do you know what the clock said? 40. Three seconds. <laughs> I'm telling you, I looked at that and I was like, this is going to be the longest 43 seconds of my life. Anyway, uh, I went in there, uh, managed to dunk one of the balls, but as I did, he literally ripped the top of my singlet off. So I finished the event with just the bottoms on, and as I dunked it, I like threw up my arms like this. All my friends were like, he did it! And that was like my moment of redemption. So anyways, uh, Let's put things into perspective. You're here for 75 minutes today, and I'm sure you heard the one about the entrepreneur from Champagne who woke up today not feeling well and had to go to the doctor. You've heard that one? So you go to the doctor, and you say, Doc, I'm not feeling well. The doc diagnoses you and says, I've got good news and bad news. The bad news is you've only got 75 minutes to live. And you're like, Doc, how can that be good news? You say, well, there's a guy named Norm Billsbury. He's giving a presentation today about sales and business development for startups. You should enroll in that and sit in the back. And uh, you look at the doc and you say, doc, how is that good news? And the doctor says, I promise you, it will extend your life because it will be the longest 75 minutes of your life. <laughs> so enough of, of the nonsense. Uh, who is Norm Billsbury, Sandler Training? Uh, these are some of the companies that Sandler has coached around business development, sales. Um, probably one of our uh, biggest uh, success stories recently is uh, Slump. It's a, a cloud-based startup of 2003, which has had a $1.2 billion exit. So uh, you can see that we work in a variety of industries. The reason we can do that is because our models are industry agnostic. So LinkedIn, Salesforce, uh, KPMG, uh, and a number of uh, companies here you can see. Um, my big thing that I'm thinking that you're probably asking as you're sitting here listening to this presentation is, well, that's nice, uh, Sandler sounds great, but I'm giving up 75 minutes of my time, and really what I want to know is what am I going to get out of this? And by the way, should I really sit down and give 75 minutes to this person? Why do they have the right to take up that time in my life, and what am I going to get out of it? Now, here's the reason why I'm thinking maybe you're thinking that. Because when I was in your position in a startup and somebody wanted to take my time, that's the question I was asking. Why? Because you've got cash, you've got runway, you've got goals. And when you give your time up, you need to get something back in return. Is that fair? Anybody of you, any of you thinking like that? Because that's, that's a little bit of the question that I'm asking. So here's the thing. I don't want to necessarily claim that I have the right to take up that time. I'll just tell you a little bit about my background and you can decide to what extent you want to buy into what I'm sharing today. Uh, so, attending Illinois, I was a communications major. My dad was an engineer, uh, developed a gunnery for the F-15 and the A-10. And he wanted me to be an engineer, and I was not. And so, my first summer job was a valet at Tony's Restaurant in Alton, Illinois. And here's the thing. I made $2 an hour, and one thing I learned is that the beer drinkers tipped about a buck if you got their car really fast. But if the guys drank scotch, sometimes they'd tip you about 3 or $4. So... That's the one thing I learned. And then I started asking the question, how can I make more money? Because see, my father worked on salary. And that's all we knew in our home. I didn't know there was such a thing as commission. I came back that summer, and a friend of mine uh, worked uh, selling books door to door. And these were homework manuals that helped kids out with school, math, and science. 
And I said, what do you do this summer? And he said, well, I sold books door to door. I'm like, oh my gosh, that sounds terrible. He goes, yeah, it was. And then he's just really quiet. And I said, so, okay, I got curious. Because he just looked extremely calm and confident. And I said, well, how much money did you make? And we're, you know, we're just out. And he's like, oh, I made about $12,000. And I said, you made $12,000 in the summer selling books door to door? And he's like, yeah. And I said, well, what kind of books? And he showed me uh, one, one, one week after that. And I decided that commission was a much better idea than getting paid on salary. So for the next three summers, I made 12,000 cold calls. And so what I'm sharing with you is I learned a little bit about sales in those 12,000 cold calls. When I got back, I knew I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. And I was giving a presentation at a company in a sales role. And somebody said, Norm, you're a good trainer. You should probably get your master's degree in training. I did at Illinois State. I gave another presentation here at the University of Illinois. And by this time, I realized I really wanted to consult and help leaders grow their businesses. And so somebody said, Pillsbury, have you ever thought about getting your PhD? And I said, yes. And they invited me to the program here, and I completed that. Went to work for Anderson Consulting. And I did that. And while I loved Anderson for what it taught me, here's the thing I learned. I didn't want to travel 100%. So when I didn't want to travel 100%, I basically, uh, a friend of mine approached me and said, have you thought about a sales role? And I said, a sales role? Why would I ever go back into sales? I have a PhD. And he said, well, let me ask you, what do you do? And I said, well, I help with organizational change. He goes, what is that exactly? And I said, well, it's where you get leaders in a room. They have a conflicted vision of the future state of the organization. You get all the leaders to buy in to the desired state of the organization, and you help with change management. And he looked at me, and he goes, and that's not sales? Now, part of the title of my talk is, Everyone is in Sales. At that point, I realized, as a change management consultant with a PhD from the University of Illinois, I was in sales. Have you ever had that thought that I'm in sales? Does anybody want to challenge the notion that maybe you're not in sales? This is okay. I want to keep this a conversation. Does anybody want to kind of take that on and say, I'm not in sales? Well, here's the thing. Do you know why I didn't like the fact that maybe I could be in sales? Because at the same time, Sometimes there's a little bit of head trash with the topic or the title of a sales role, isn't there? Because with salespeople, there's a negative stereotype. And so one of the things I want to help you get out of today is how to know you're selling effectively without being salesy. Because you can do that. You can maintain your business stature, not give up your integrity, and uh, help sell with world-class psychology in a way where you position yourself to win, but at the same time, it's not manipulative. Is anybody kind of interested in that? See, that's what I wanted to be. So here's the thing. I took that offer to sell on the North Shore of Chicago, and then something crazy happened. Because I made a commitment to myself. I'm never going to be a salesperson that, you know, you, you look and see in the movies, you know, the stereotypical. And uh, what happened is, the next five years, I was the number one salesperson in Chicago. And then, I actually was uh, the number one person in the company out of 600 people. And I, look, I grew up in an Air Force family, and we had two cars in our driveway. One was a Volkswagen Bug, and the other was a 1972 International Harvester truck. Has anybody ever seen those types of cars? So, like, that's, that was where I came from. I'm telling you, I was a middle-class kid. So when I was on salesperson here, they gave me a Cartier watch. And do you know what? I didn't even know what that was. I had to Google it, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is really worth something. So uh, I'm just sharing a little bit about what selling has done for me and how it has helped me, but at the same time, I think I've recruited two medical device companies, and, and uh, Laura did a nice job of telling you a little bit about that. So that's my background, and here's why I did that. When I got my PhD, what I, I was invited to be faculty here, but I didn't want to just study it, I wanted to do it. How many of you wanted to do it, rather than read about it? Right? Yeah, so here's the thing, I realized I was like a, a medical device, or a medical student who has an MD, but had never done an operation. So that's why I went into like marketing, sales, and training roles. So anyways, as I go through this, I wanted to just share a little bit about my background, because sometimes you're sitting there going, how do you know? Why should I listen to this guy? What does this guy really know? And here's the thing, I've carried it on the streets, I've sat in the executive room, 
And now I help consult with companies to build their sales strategies and their sales teams. So that's a little bit about my background. So uh, what's cool about what we do is our content is actually taught in the halls of the Harvard MBA program. So what I'm sharing with you today is actually world-class content. All right, We're, I'm just going to be a brief peek at some, some things today. But what I want you to know is that this stuff is as is, is good as gold. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, some goals and objectives. The first thing I want to know is why are you here? Okay? And uh, let's, uh, because you came here for a reason, you're taking up, you're taking time out of your schedule, and what were those reasons? So if you'll pull out this sheet right there in front of you, uh, go ahead and put your name, your company, uh, and, and you don't have to share your email. If, if you don't want me to contact you, I'll talk a little bit about that later when we get into this. But what I want to do is just read through some of the things that you think you could do more effectively and just put a checkbox around some of those things. So just go ahead and read that list and check any of those things that think that you think applies to your startup. Gosh, I think we could be better if I knew when I was pitching investors, I was doing something a little bit differently. Maybe if my team had a system. Maybe if I could get my team to buy in to a system. Maybe if we had some training. So the next question on this is, how much does this cost to you not doing this that well? Because a little bit of what I think the challenge is as a business owner in a startup is this. You have limited runway, and you've got to get that plane off the ground, right? Maybe you've got grant funding, maybe you've got cash, you've got budget, but if you don't get that plane off the ground within that runway, you're going to be in trouble. Is that fair? Right? So not doing these things effectively can cost you. The plane staying on the ground longer than you wanted. That is a problem in the startup world. And here's the thing, we've got to start thinking about sales early on. Why? Because if you look at the research, you have the technology, you have the two technology curves. The first is um, uh, really grant funding. And grant funding tapers off and runs out at some point. And then you have commercialization. And in the middle, do you know what they call that? What do they call that? The valley of death. The valley of what? Death. The valley of death. Isn't that, <laughs> doesn't that just sound ominous? So here's the thing. Why am I here today, guys? I want to help you win. I want to help you avoid the valley of death. I want to help you get that plane off the ground. And just a quick side note here. Uh, does anybody know the horse that won the Preakness this year? The name of the horse that won the Preakness. It's got a very, it's got a great name. Okay, why would I bring up horse racing in the start in the start of incubator? Because aren't what you're doing a little bit isn't a little bit of a horse a horse bet, right? When you look down the road, can you control the factors that are going to lead to a successful exit? Do you know where it's going, or do you just you have a vision, you have an idea, and you're going for it, right? But can you control that outcome? Obviously you can't. So it's a horse bet. Here's the thing. The horse that won the Preakness this year was War of Will. And what's interesting is it was sired by a horse called War Front, and the mayor was Vision of Clarity. Now, why would I bring up three horse names at a talk in a startup incubator? Because here's the, here's the connection guys are making a run. And you, you've done everything you can with your value proposition, with your funding, to take care of that horse, train that horse. But you've got to go race, and you've got to get that horse out of the gate, right? And here's the thing. War of Will's father was named War Front. How many of you know that if you're going to go from the grant funding, cross the valley of death, and get commercialized, you're going to go into a war zone. How many of you know that? Raise your hand if you, if you believe that. 
How many, it's okay, you want to have a conversation. If you don't think that's true, tell me why not. Well, here's, here's the thing. I know it's true. Because I'll tell you what. In the two medical device companies that I, I went with, I did something you should never do. I moved from Chicago to Cleveland. Now, that's an opportunity to laugh right there. You guys should take it, okay? It's, it's a long 75 minutes. But seriously, I did. And do you know why? Because when I looked at this technology, it was a disruptive technology. And I knew it was hands down better. My three-year-old daughter, I said, sweetheart, if you use this device to do this operation, I showed her a quick video of it, and, then, and this device to use do this operation, which one would you choose? She goes, Daddy, I'd choose that one, which was the one I chose. But do you know when I got to Cleveland that none of the doctors were interested in using the device? And you know why? Is because a lot of them hadn't been given equity in the company and they wanted it. What I'm telling you is politics, business, it's a war zone. And that's that first horse name. But here's the thing, what's going to save you is the mayor's name, vision of clarity. Do you know your why? Are you clear about your vision? If you don't know your vision, here's what's going to happen. You're going to get up one day, you're going to get in the shower to go to work, and you're going to be sitting there showering and you're going to go, why am I going to work today? Because I'm going to a war zone and things aren't really working out, and I don't like the way it feels. So here's the thing what I'm sharing with you is you have to have vision of clarity. So war zone is where, where you're going, which vision of clarity, the mayor of this horse will win. And then here's the thing, war of will was the cult that those two bred. And so when I bring that all to back together, what I'm saying is this, it's gonna come down to a war of will. Because sometimes making the right decision isn't as important as this, making the decision right. Once you make a decision, you have to commit to that and make it right. And it is a war of will. And there are some things that you know, when you're trying to get that plane off the ground, when you pass certain markers in your startup, you can't change, you can't go back. When you spend that money, that option to do what you thought you were going to do is gone. And so the key is you get that plane further down the runway, you have to be convicted that you're going in the right direction. And then you've got to know how you're going to get your money back, right? Because that's what your investors want to know. How are you going to pay me back? They were looking for a multiple when they invested in you. Is that fair? Yeah, they are. And so they're looking for a way to, for how are you going to pay them back? And so this is where sales, sales strategy, business development enters the equation, right? Because the healthiest metric for any organization is what? Revenue. Revenue, right? And specifically, you can get revenue through acquisition, right? But, but the best revenue is what? Profit. Pardon? Profit. Yeah, absolutely. Profit through organic sales. Right? Because it shows demand. You know it's predictable. You're going to get it next quarter. And hopefully you'll get a bump. And that's where your investors are going, okay, this was the right course for me to bet on. Your, your value proposition, your technology, whatever it is your company does, this is, this, is a good, this is a good horse to keep my money on. And so that's the way they're thinking about you. And I'm just sharing that as a metaphor. Okay, so when you look at this, who checked off what? Just Would somebody share some things they checked off? Harvey? Does anybody want to share something they check? Find new business. Pardon me? Find new business. Find new business. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Coach yes. More efficiently. Pardon me? Coach more efficiently. Coach more efficiently. Yeah. Yeah, you've got to have team members. You've got to coach, coach them more efficiently. Find new business. Here's the thing a little bit. Let's make this distinction right now. Is prospecting and selling the same thing? No. Why? What is prospecting? What is selling? What's the difference? True execution. Here's, here's the thing. When you're prospecting, you're just calling out the ore to see if there's potential for gold in it. Is that fair? So what I'm simply saying is this. If you try to sell somebody before you qualify them, are you selling to a prospect? So right now, when you're prospecting, you're talking to somebody, they're a suspect, and until you qualify them, and you know 
that they have certain qualifications, like they have budget, they have interest, they have a problem that you would solve. Once that happens, you move from prospecting to selling. If you try to sell somebody who's a suspect, you're pitching somebody who can't buy. You see, everybody clear on that? Okay. So here's the thing. Uh, let's just talk. We're going to talk about selling systems, uh, how we sell today, how buyers buy, and then present an alternative system. Because uh, as we think about what we're doing, we take a step back from the war zone. There's a couple of different schools of thought and thought leaders that take a step back from the war zone. And I'm going to cover this. So uh, here's the thing. I, I think one of the things you might be here is because of this famous quote from Steve Jobs. Anybody, anybody uh, who's got a loud voice and can read this? Can somebody stand up who's got a loud voice and can read it? I'll do it. Okay, thank you. All right. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs and the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them, but the only thing that you can't do is ignore them because they are changed things. They change things. They push the human race forward, and while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see gen genius because the ones who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do. Steve Jobs, 1997. Awesome. How about, how about a hand for that? That was nice. <laughs> Let me just, just share something a little bit about sales that just, I think, was demonstrated right there in that moment. Uh, did, did you kind of feel the uncomfortableness cross the room when I said, who will stand up and read that? How many of you honestly felt that, like, I hope he doesn't pick me? Is that, yeah? Okay. Here's the thing. Uh, one of the things about sales and, and business development and prospecting and finding customers is you often have to engage people that you don't know. And you find yourself conversing with people you don't know. And it's not natural, really, to go up and talk to people we don't know, is it? How many of you know your mom taught you not to talk to strangers? Yeah? My mom taught me that. That tape is in my head. So when I start to go talk to somebody I don't know, I just feel uncomfortable automatically. Um, honestly, before even giving this talk, I was very, very nervous. And why? Because I don't know all of you. What I'm sharing with you is uh, what this wonderful lady did for all of us. She exemplified the key to success. Here's the thing. You can't boil the ocean and solve all the problems of your startup in, in you know, all at once. But you can do this. 30 seconds of guts at a time. I want you to remember that. 30 seconds of guts at a time. Because once you do that, you step into that uncomfortable, then you know it, you find out you live. And you know what, you realize that wasn't so bad. I need to do that again. But when I do it again, gosh, maybe I'll try it differently. And we're gonna talk about that, okay? So we've talked about uh, why you're here. What I'm gonna do is tell you why I'm here. And I'm here because I want to help people win. I think if I were in your shoes, what I would dream about is an exit. How many of you dream about an exit? Want a big exit, right? And want to sell your company, right? Uh, so that's the thing. I think when it comes back to uh, all of us, one, one metaphor that I think captures this better thing is catching a fish. And it's like, hey, mom or dad, look at the fish I caught. Now, what I'm going to share is a story about how I caught this fish. I had gone fishing the day before, hadn't caught anything, literally fished all day with my son. We didn't catch uh, squat, and it was like 90 degrees in the Florida heat. I didn't want to go fishing the next day, and I said, geez, this is really terrible, but I realized the next day I would be back in the cornfields of Illinois, so I went to the beach. And when I went to the beach, I, instead of using my rod, I brought my net. And this is what I caught. I'll just play this for you. It's a quick one minute video. Hey, Norm here. I'm in uh, Destin, Florida, and I was fascinated with mullet. The mullet came in like probably 500 of them jumping out of the water. It was just a great time to cast. So I cast my net, but this is what was chasing the mullet. My net got this. It's a huge jack for bell. It's probably 60 pounds. I don't know. But it's heavy. So, thank you, Lord. Hey, Norm here. So, then I was able to do this, share it with my son. 
and he, you can imagine how happy he was to hold that fish. Look how it's, it's, it's so big, it's almost bigger than him. So here's the thing, I want to help you win, okay? You're going into a war zone. You have to have a clarity of vision, and you have to have a will to win. When I didn't catch any fish the day before, the last thing I wanted to do was go fishing the next day. Sometimes in your startup life, that's the way you're going to feel on your way to work. But I want you to remember this because this is what can happen if you just show up and do what's right in terms of growing your business. And here's the thing. Sometimes to grow your business, you have to do what's uncomfortable and not natural. Talk to people you don't know. And when you get good at that, this is what can happen. So here's the thing. Uh, I'm going to just give you education. And at the end of this, uh, I'm going to ask you permission to give my uh, shameless 30-second commercial. Is that an okay trade? Okay, uh, and then I'm going to ask one other question. What was your biggest takeaway? And you'll share this at your table. Uh, but for now, what I'd like you to do is just take a moment at your tables, turn to the person next to you, and tell them why you're here. What do you want to get out of this presentation? So just go ahead and do that right now. Seconds of guts. Go ahead. So I do a marketing business. Yes. Something that I like to do is also bring more value to my customers by also like talking to them and working on how we can improve their business, not just the marketing they provide, but also like is there a way to position ourselves so that they can sell better and not just sell so learn a bit from your presentation and how it's complicated and better. I think that's excellent. And here's the thing that I heard this gentleman share is you know what I want to do, Norm, is I want to understand their problems. Because if I understand their problems, I can create more value. And if I create more value, I might have a better chance of selling them. Is that correct? Yeah. Now, what did, what did you notice that he did not want to do? He did not want to go in and just what? Make money. Right. No, there is no profit. He, he wants to do that to keep his business going, but it's not his lead motive, right? It's not his real why. He wants to solve a problem first. But he's not going to tell you and say, let me tell you why we're great. Yeah. Wink, wink, right? You hear, this is why my company is so great. Do you see how he stayed away from that? So solving problems, that's what salespeople do. That's what business development people do. That's how you become a consultant. Focus on solving the problem instead of selling your service. So excellent. Who else? What else do you want to get out of this? Somebody looked at their neighbor and said, I need one more person to have 30 seconds of guts. Yes? Oh, to see if your idea has any sellable, like, is it, can you sell this idea? Is, it any, is there demand? Is there any? Okay. So you're more like trying to understand your value proposition. Is that correct? Yeah. Now that's a very important thing for a startup to solve, right? And I'm just going to share, share this with you. When I was in medical devices, our engineers came to the, the sales and marketing team and said, let me tell you why these surgeons want to use this mesh to, for these hernias. And they gave us all their clinical reasons. Well, it's got bigger intercities for the macrophages. Um, polyester is going to be more hydrophilic. And they gave us all this clinical language, right? We learned all this. They gave us big tests on this. But do you know why those surgeons wanted to use that mesh when we went into the operating room? Because it was easier. They forgot to add that to the sales pitch. Because you know why? They got so focused on the science. 
But here's the thing. A good rule in sales to remember is this. Customers don't buy for your reasons. They buy for their reasons. And that's a very important question, sir, that you're asking. If I did this, why might you like it? And you need to run that through focus groups, right, to understand the value proposition and segment those customers to understand why that value proposition is different to each segment, correct? Right? And then you've got a pitch, once you learn that, that you can tailor for those customers when you know you're targeting that specific profile. Fair? Yeah. So, excellent. I'm glad you're here for those reasons. I think we'll get this. So, here's the thing. Let's just step back. I'm going to share a quick perspective. Coaches, military advisors, and scientists all seek this perspective. It's called an executive perspective. What that really means is I'm going to step out of my world, I'm going to look at my world, and I'm going to look at it as a system. Okay? And so, uh, sports coaches, what do they do when they're not playing games? On the weekend before the game or the weekend after the game, what do they do? They analyze the game. What do they do? How do they do that? They watch game film, right? Here's the thing. When you go meet with your prospect, you have to take yourself out of it and go, what's the game film in that meeting? Right? And a little bit of the question here is Dr. Deming. Does anybody know who Dr. Deming is in the car industry? What he did for the car industry? So after Nagasaki and Hiroshima, he was a statistician and he brought systems to the U.S. automakers in the 40s. And he said, folks, you guys ought to consider my systems perspective. You know why? Because it'll help you make better cars. Do you know what the three big automakers said to Dr. Deming? They said, see ya, don't want to talk to you. And so a little country called Japan that had been devastated in World War II listened to Deming. Deming gave those manufacturers a system. And what happened in the 70s? Automakers like Toyota, Nissan, right? Datsun came on the scene. Have they ever left? In the 80s, these three, uh, these three big automakers came back to Dr. Denny, and Denny excoriated them. He said, you were listening to me 40 years ago. Why do you want me now? Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, Dr. Denny, our, our market share has been eroded. We've lost revenue. That's because you don't have a system. Here's the thing. With sales, you need a system. So this is uh, a page. Lovey Smith, football coach here in Illinois. What's he doing before a game? He's watching game film. Why? He wants to understand the other team's system. You need a system. So let's talk about what that looks like. Quiz real quick. If you want to win, what's the most important of these four P's that you learn about in your MBA program? People. People. Why? They do the other three. They do the other three. I think that's an excellent answer, right? Now, out of the gate, you can win with the superior technology and, and proprietary if you have uh, IP, right? You can win. But that IP eventually dwindles, right? But how many of you think that there is a better sales person, uh, salesperson going into an account today selling an inferior product at a superior price? You bet. That happens all the time. And there's reasons for it. So let's just skip this a little bit because of time. But I want to talk to you about the two problems that really happen with salespeople. One is you have to ask yourself, do you believe in what you sell? Do you, and I'm asking you that right now, do you believe in what you sell? Because if you don't, you should leave that company immediately. Because your attitude about that product or that service, if you don't believe in it in your heart, you're not going to be able to help that company win. It's going to come out. But here's the other place where people are challenged. They don't believe in the way they sell. And when they don't believe in the way they sell, it looks like this. Some people have what we call business stature issues. That means, psychologically, when they meet certain people with titles or who have a lot of money, a little bit of an inferiority complex creeps in, and they can't talk to those people. We call that business stature. So, if you want to sell something, you've got to find people with what? Budget, money, right? And sometimes, the people have money, why? Because they protect it. They won't give it up. Right? Those people are guardians of that budget. And so if you send somebody in who doesn't have equal business stature, is looking up to that person, I really hope that you would like what we have, and it's really good, and let me tell you why. You can see how that person feels like a child is talking to them rather than an equal. 
So what I'm sharing with you in terms of developing a superior sales system for your team, your people, you need to check their business stature. What's this person's demeanor in front of a prospect? Will they have the confidence it takes to ask for the money or to close the deal? The other thing is technical. Do they know what to say and then when, when to say? You look at sports teams, do they have plays? Why? Because a play offers a more predictable way of getting the ball across the plate or across the end zone. So let's just talk about the three systems. What I'd like for you to do now is take a break. And this is a traditional sales model. This is what happens in America every day. People, this is the way they sell. I want you to just take a moment, or the person next to you, and put these in order and tell me what order you put them in. So go ahead. to sell something, what does everybody expect? A little what? A little chit chat, right? Now is that chit chat important? Yeah, why is it important? Yeah, it's really about getting comfortable with somebody, isn't it? Right? Can you blow a sales if you don't chit chat appropriately? You absolutely can. That's right. So uh, that's very important to recognize when it's happening and when to stop it. Right, because some personality types like to talk a lot and about themselves, right? And we know that some traditional salespeople do that, and do prospects like it? No. So we have to be very careful about that. Now, to the flip side, there's some of you who are introverts and don't like chit chat. Anybody in here an introvert doesn't like chit chat? Oh, I know. I'm talking to him. I, I know. I'm asking a lot of questions, and some of you've been real quiet, right? So, the thing is, is that's okay too, but here's the thing, is that going to help you in business, with business development? Right, so we have to learn the thing. Let me give you um, introverts hope here. The extroverts don't win here. I have coached a lot of introverts, and I call them my sales assassins. You know why? Because a prospect, go ahead. They shut up. 
they should, like sometimes like a customer starts talking and they just talk over them. Like if they're quiet, you kind of like let them talk and relax and they'll tell you a lot more. Absolutely. One of our rules for a sales call or business development or if you're pitching, listen 70%, talk 30. Have self-awareness around how you're modulating your, your, your answer and your questions and how much you're talking. And if it's not listening that much, you're, you're, you're actually not getting the information. We believe when you go to a sales call, you should get information, not give it, until the right time. So, uh, that's right, the word, and the sales people do this to uncover a need, right? And once they uncover a need and they qualify somebody, and in some of the consultative sales programs I've been through, then we present and go, okay, you know what? Uh, they have a need, I'm gonna pitch. So here we go, present, blah, 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 blah. it's great, you should get it, here's why, because you told me you like this, and this is what you needed, and so here we go. And then we say, man, the business, we close. And that's where there's actually an expected stall or objection. That's when the prospect kind of knows the ask is coming. And so they often give you, right, a stall or objection. So think about this. If I gave you, if I was your insurance agent and you wrecked your car, and I gave you $75,000 today to go buy a new car, how many of you would at least go visit two or three lots? Yeah. So what's going to happen at that first lot? What's that car salesperson going to try to do? They're going to say, what do I have to say to put you in a car today, right? <laughs> That's a joke. So the point being is this. If you know you want to look, if you're looking at Audi, and you also want to look at BMW, and you want to look at Mercedes, right, because you have 75000 right, you're going to have a planned answer for that salesperson, aren't you? Do you see what I'm saying? Do you not know this model? Do you not know it? Come on, give me a head nod, yes or no. Do you know this model? Because you expect it being done to you. You know what your way out is, right? Here's the thing. What I'm simply saying is this. If you're a football team, what you're saying is, is I know the offense that's coming against me. And I know when I'm going I'm to get out. They're coming down the field with a ball, and they're going to ask for my business, but I know when I can roll and get away from them. Don't you all know that? See, what I'm saying is this is the system, right? And this is what the military, this is what coaches, this is what scientists know. What I'm saying is the sales environment is filled with systems, and we as entrepreneurs need to be aware of them, because if we aren't, guess what? That system is going to be used against you. And you're going to be stuck on your runway without getting that plane off the ground and out of budget. So you've got to know the sales, that's, the, the things that's coming against you. So here's the thing. Do you know that the prospect has a system? So why don't you take a moment and put these in order? The prospect system. Because when you go to sell somebody, right, the prospect actually has a system. Why don't you try to put these in order? Go ahead, at your tables right now, please, go. Okay, 
let's uh, wrap it up here. That's really it in. And just for the sake of time, here's the thing. I do want to, I think I think up front you were told this is a little bit longer than your normal luncheon. We'll go to, to 115. So uh, we're going to wrap up uh, a little bit before on time, actually. So I'll get you out of here. Is that okay with everybody still? Just checking. I think you had advance notice on that for just a little bit longer. So we'll, we'll, we'll finish up right before that for you. Um, but let's just do this out loud. So who had, uh, uh, who wants to try to put these in order for us? I know there's an introvert out there who hasn't spoken, who's going to, and it's this lady right here. Go ahead. Okay, I think that's almost a spot on analysis. Can you just tell me why you put chit chat first? That's right. So here's the thing. You're a startup company. You're a manager on a team. You have a salesperson. You send that salesperson out to sell your product. And the prospect says, y'all meet. Your salesperson says, guess what, Mr. CEO, Mr. CEO? I have a meeting. I'm really excited. When they walk in, that prospect, what are they expecting? Chit-chat. They know your salespeople are going to chit-chat. So the next step you have is what? Mislead. Wait a second. Are they actually going to try to manipulate you, the prospect? Think about this. Is this really fair? Wait a second. They're actually going to intentionally try to mislead you. Yeah, they will. Now, here's the thing. They can actually mislead you to the positive, and they can lead you to the negative. So they can play you either way. Now, here's the thing. Do you know, while you're kind of learning about how to sell, do you know where buyers go? Buyers go to buying school. They do. They have formal programs for purchasing agents and buying agents, and they're called anti-negotiation tactics training. So when you train your sales team and you learn how to sell more effectively, your buyers are getting trained. And do you know what they're taught? Emotional warfare. Emotional warfare. Uh, let me just give you a quick example. Um, what psychology teaches us about your emotional state and your psychological state is this. In one, any one moment, you can live in three ego states. And so, just permit me, if you will, to call them this. Parent, adult, child. Now the way this works, and I'm going to use my wife as an example, and I have permission to do this. She's really nice. But if my wife goes to buy shoes before, like, say, Christmas Eve church service, she'll look at the shoes and she'll go, oh, look at the little red ones with the silver bow. I, I've got to have those. I'll never wear them again, but I want them. Okay? So what ego state is coming up? The child, right? I want I need, it's, which where emotion is, right? But then she asks herself this question, do I have enough money in the checking account? Isn't that probably the next question, right? So, uh, do, you, do I have enough money? Do you see how that's just rational? There's no emotion there. That's just a rational yes or no question. That's the adult ego state kicking in. Now then, but then she has to ask the parent inside of her. And what's the parent do? Gives permission. Don't you remember growing up, you had to ask your parents permission for everything? Right, so here's the thing, you do that internally. So she goes like this, I want them, I have the money, but will I let myself buy them? Do you see how she gives herself permission? Do you see how that, this, the transition from three ego states happen in milliseconds, or nanoseconds, whatever you want to say it is, right? Well, here's the thing, I said that buyers go to buyer school and they want to inflict emotional warfare on you. So you know what happens in, in the negotiation and that's important for your company? Uh, salesperson, this is the buyer, and the buyer takes on what they call a critical parent role, intentionally. And critical parent says to salesperson, you know what, your prices are terrible. You're coming in here asking for all of this, we've got this, we've got that service. They're not letting you know they really want it, but they're making you feel the pain. They're going, we've got that, why, why would we give up this for that? Now, 
When somebody starts talking negatively to you, even if you're an adult, you know what ego state you hear it in? The child. How many of you have ever been humped at in traffic and you get mad? And you're like, how dare that person? Right? And you wave at it. No, you don't. But the point is, is what happens here is they're hitting, and why are they doing this? Because they know if they can put you in a child ego state, you will, your negotiation strategy will fall apart. And you'll go, well, I just would hope you would like to buy it because I really need the sale. And so what do you do? You drop your prices. But they're taught these things. So just as you're taking time out to learn about sales, what I'm sharing with you, those buyers, go to school and learn how to beat your, your sales team and uh, you up. And don't you think your VCs, what do they want? More equity. They do. Now, is it acceptable for this stuff to happen in business? You bet. Where else does a little bit of like this type of stuff happen? Sports. What does a quarterback do when he drops back? Then he what? Pumps this way. Why does he do that? Get the defense to shift, right? And then what does he do? Throws long this way, right? So there's head fakes. You gotta watch your prospect because they will mislead you. And they know that they want to delay and stall. So you can see that their whole reason of like, you know what, I don't know if we're really interested, they'll go negative on you, is to what? Get your information. Now why do they want your information? Because your product solves a problem for them. And they know they need it to stay competitive. The value proposition you've been dreaming about for your startup, it's actually very important, but they're not gonna tell you that until after you sell it to them at a price that they want. So what I'm simply helping you understand is remember the prospect has a system. You're coming down hoping it's gonna work out well, but what I'm telling you is you've gotta be careful. You can't get emotionally involved in that transaction. And you have to know the war games that are being played against you so that you don't just give up and give it away for free or at a low price. Because you spent all this time developing it, and it's very important. So what happens then, after they get the information, you call back and say, well, we have a really great meeting. Don't you want to talk? And you know what they do? Well, I talked over with my committee, and it just might not be the right thing for us, and they mislead again. And then they delay, and they go into with this protection plan for prospects. Like, you can't find them. You had a great conversation, you call them back, and they disappear. Now, do you know that prospects believe this? That it's okay to lie to salespeople? Because they know that it's okay to lie to salespeople because they're still gonna go to heaven. They believe that. I'm just telling you, that's what prospects believe. For some reason, it's okay to lie to salespeople, right? This is not really a lie. But see, if you're running a business, you have to know where the head banks are. And this is where coaching your people is very important and why you need an offense. All right, so is there an alternative system? And the answer is yes. We don't have to engage in this nonsense. This is what, what I teach, the Sandler system. And here's the thing. I'm gonna teach you briefly and quickly how to sell like a doctor. And I like very much what this gentleman on the blue shirt shared earlier about what he wants to do is solve a problem. Because let me ask you, when you go in to meet a doctor for the first time, how many of you have ever been greeted by a doctor who says, you really should let me operate on you because I went to Harvard Medical School? Has a doctor ever said that to you? If they did, what should you do? Run the other way, right? right? But that's what salespeople do, don't they? Let me tell you why you should buy our product. What does a doctor do? A doctor listens, right? Ask questions. And you start to trust the doctor because they ask you such good questions, don't you? Oh yeah, doctor, it hurts right there. And what is the doctor trying to figure out? Where it hurts. What I'm telling you is this. Don't sell on features and benefits. Sell on pain. When you go in and talk to your, 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 your prospects, uh, Mr. Mr. Prospect, so thanks for inviting me in. What problem is it that you were hoping I could solve for you today? Because you know they have a problem. Then they're going to start talking about what hurts. You see how that's different than going in and you should buy it because of blah, blah, blah. It's great. So uh, we have actually 
an agnostic model that works in any, any, any corporate environment or startup environment. And the first part of this is, a, is volume rapport. We use a submarine. Subs are what? Stealth, right? You don't see it coming. Here's the thing. You use this model, your prospects won't feel it's happening to them. But what we recognize is volume rapport. Did you know volume rapport is actually a science? The literature and organizational behavior is clear. In nanoseconds, you either click or clash. Have you ever been to a cocktail party, met somebody, and like just in a few seconds you're like, I don't think I want to talk to that person. And you go the other way. Has that ever happened? Sure. Right? In nanoseconds you knew. Do you see, in, in nanoseconds sometimes you meet some people and you're like, I really want to talk to that person more. You click. You click or clash. Here's the thing, at a cocktail party, you have the option of talking to certain people. In business development, when you're trying to get your company off the ground, do you have the same options you had at a cocktail party? Sometimes you have to work with people you don't like. Is that fair? That's right. So here's the thing, you have to understand how to click with people who are very different from you. Introverts, you have to come out of your shell. Extroverts, you have to tone it down. But here's the thing, if you don't have the emotional intelligence to understand the self-awareness, if you need to tone it down or ratchet it up, you will clash more often than you will click. So we have to have a bonding report. The other thing is, we need to agree on what we're trying to solve. Have you ever walked into a meeting and you don't agree on the purpose of the meeting? Well, I thought I was here to tell you this. Well, I thought we were here just to talk about it. Do you see how like, you get out of the gate, you're missing each other way up front? So that's the purpose of upfront contract. We then get into pain, budget, decision, and then not until the end do we present. If you notice the traditional sales model, where did they present? Towards the front. Let me see if you have a need, and then let me show you, I'll show you what I got. What we're saying is this, don't present until the end. Because remember, what does the customer really, what the prospect really want? Free information. What I'm teaching, what I'm teaching teach you to do, don't give away your information at a booth or at a trade show until you know that person's qualified. Because sometimes just that hope, opium, you'll want it to present and you won't really have an answer. Okay, so here's our system versus the prospect system. Um, what I'd like you to do now is just turn to somebody at your table, tell them the number one thing that you got out of today's presentation. Go ahead, just take a moment, maybe go around the table or just share it with the next person next to you. What did I get out of the presentation? Then I have a book giveaway here, so if you want to, I've got a couple of books to give away, so don't leave if you want to be enrolled in the book giveaway. Okay, so here's the thing, real quick, and just a couple of people, what's the number one takeaway you got out of today's presentation? Pardon me? Business is war. Business, yes, I'm afraid it is. Yeah, why? Why? Because you're taking somebody else's revenue stream. Somebody else is feeding their family, getting their paycheck, and when you come up with a new invention, what's gonna happen? That revenue gets redirected to you. The person who lost that revenue, are they happy? I'm just asking, put yourself in their shoes. Somebody takes your revenue, you happy? Is that a good day at work? No, that's a little bit about what happens. Right? Now here's the thing, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to turn into like a war mentality thing. I actually think you should take the position of a monk. Be disciplined, uh, goodwill towards everybody, solve people's problems. Um, but, but do recognize there will be some people who want to take you out. Right? And in that fact, you're right. So what is another takeaway? 30 seconds of guts. Love it. Yeah. You do. You're going to have to move into the uncomfortable if you want to succeed in business. You've got to always push yourself to grow. Learn a new skill, right? And present to people that you don't think would be interested or that you're afraid of, right? Why? Because it's going to develop your business stature and your courage. 
What else? Yes? Um, what would the alternative model uh, not presenting until the end? That's right. That's excellent. Yeah. Hold back. Hold back. Whoa. Don't show them what you've got. Don't quote until you've qualified them. Do, does your, do you know what their pain is? Do they have budget to pay for it? And then are they the decision maker? What if you show what you've got to the person that can't make a decision? What's going to happen? Your sales process is going to be stalled. So you've got to work hard to qualify. Okay? Yeah? What do you do, what do, you do in conversations that don't qualify? Like say we're talking, you figure out A is useless. How do you use that? Or how do you get out of that? Yeah, that is a great question. Here's the thing. What we teach is this. I don't have time to go into the vocabulary, but we would say stay left on the pendulum. And what that means is this. Um, your name is? Vrain. Pardon me? Vrain. Vrain? Well, Vrain, uh, well, thanks for meeting with me today. Uh, it seems like my product has a problem that would solve uh, some of the challenges you have at your company. Is that fair? Sure. Yeah. And then you do have ample budget based on what we said, based on the expense that, you know, or the investment that my product would bring to your company. But it sounds like you're not the decision maker. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Well, should we just pause the conversation right here? Maybe you should go talk to people on your committee to see if they have enough interest to set schedule a second meeting. Is that a good thing to do for, at this point? Yeah. yeah. Okay, why don't you go internally and talk to your, your team. And if you want to set up a, a second meeting with me, let me know. Is that good? Now, how is that different from a traditional salesperson? What would a traditional salesperson have done? Try to what? Close. Close. Do you see how what I'm teaching you is back off? Right? Here's the thing. If you remember those high school dances, some of you guys, you were like, you want to dance with me? You want to dance with me? You want to dance with me? She was going, I don't want to dance with you. I don't want to dance with you, right? So, so what you have to do is, you want to dance with me? You have to back off. You have to let that prospect give them space. Because if they feel like you're pushing them or chasing them, you're going to lose them. You've got to back off. You've got to do the opposite of what you want. So that's, that's our strategy.